Good evening, everybody. Welcome back after a lengthy hiatus here of no meetings. I think everybody probably enjoyed the additional time off, but we're back at it and running again. So the first thing to do is call a meeting to order for September 16th, 2019. And then we'll approve the agenda. Has everybody had a chance to look it over? Is there any changes or additions? Seeing none, hearing none. Take a motion to approve it, please. I move to approve the agenda as written. I'll second that. Turn on the mic. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Consent agenda items. So the minutes of the August 5th meeting uh, to appoint a municipal manager as a voting delegate for the Vermont League of the City Leaves of Cities and Towns annual meeting and a third class liquor license for Maxie's restaurant. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as listed? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Second. All right. I have the VLCT paper for you to sign and then the board needs to sign the third class. Okay. So all those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Uh, how about the public? Is there anybody here from the public that wishes to speak at this time? Got some comments related to uh, some agenda items, mowing equipment. I can hold that, those comments. Okay. Go now. All right. Um, yeah, unless you want to stick around for oh, yeah. hey, That's the thing. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, I don't think we'll, I think we're going to buzz through things pretty quick here, so. I'll hold them. Okay. Uh, all right, next thing on the agenda is to consider an appointment to the Conservation Commission. And who might that be? Come on up, or the microphone's right there, I guess. Well, yeah. No, we can move one of the mics. Okay. Come on up to the table then. State your name, please, and uh, tell us why you're interested in joining the crew. Uh, William Vigdor is my formal name. I go by Billy. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, the select board for taking the time today, my, uh, the, the commissioners, chairman of the commission, for nominating me for the position. Um, what I, I'd like to be a commissioner, because what I'd like to do is bring some complementary assets to the commission. The commission has an incredible amount of talent now, wildlife biologists, forestry, dedicated people. But I bring a different skill set that I hope I can bring. So. I moved here uh, part-time in uh, April 2012. Just became a full-time resident here in April, so I'm very excited about being here. I promised my wife and myself I'd get involved. Um, I am an antitrust lawyer by trade and a national security lawyer, so it's a little odd. But over the last few years, I've done a lot of work um, in some environmental issues, particularly looking at some economic incentives of um, limiting incentives to fragmentation, looking at water funds to try to reduce the amount of or incentivize people, farmers, to use less water. And I've gotten more and more interested in the economics of that. Um, and so, I believe, so uh, I'd like to kind of continue that. I've been reviewing the literature. And over the last couple of years as a part-time resident here and now as full-time, I've been volunteering a decent amount of time with the commission, helping with the current draft of the bylaws and the commission's work in terms of commenting on the bylaws with respect to either shoots field or wildlife corridors. So I hope I can contribute, but I don't bring a traditional set of, you know, wildlife biology or something, and I think it'd be fun. Mm -hmm. um, in reference to the uh, water usage there on farmers, are there specific types of farmers that utilize more water than others? And so what we were doing at the time was, um, it was actually within the state of Texas, we were trying to help, and I'm gonna just keep the names off the public record, we were trying to help a client actually develop a water fund. The idea being was that um, in this particular jurisdiction, farmers had a limited right to lift water based on land use and water use regulations that dated back to the revolution in the state. 
to conserve water, the way it would work is a water fund would be set up so that if a farmer withdrew less water from their land, they would be able to sell their rights, like a cap and trade version for water. But what would happen too is that uh, the proceeds of the, of the trading would be taken by the nonprofit organization and it would retire some of those um, assets, which means it had water rights that it would not use, so the water would stay in the land and then go downstream. The farmer, they were also working with um, farm uh, equipment manufacturers to subsidize equipment sales to the farmers. They could borrow against some of their rights so that they could buy new equipment and make some investments in the equipment to further reduce their uh, water needs. Um, it turned out it was too small. Believe it or not, it was $250 million fund that was too small to go. It wasn't economic. But I know that this has been done in Australia before. It's an interesting idea, and I know the Nature Conservancy does a lot of these things with you know using economic incentives to have people either use their land the right way or different ways use less water, conserve. So what I'd love to do is I'd like to think more about how to do that with forest fragmentation. See what we can do about keeping forests whole and trying to find literature on valuing not just the value of trees, because I know there's work on that, but the value of trees as a continuous, um, as a contiguous area, being more valuable to have a, a forest than to have you know slots of land, at least in terms of trees, not in terms of wildlife. It, it's I'm getting into very academics here, but uh, it's interesting to me. As a former chair and longtime member of the Conservation Commission, I think you bring a good skill set to the commission. I think always different skill sets are really vital to to the commission. And I think having, you know, always having an attorney, I think, is a great you know asset on, on the com on the commission. Uh, so lots of people don't like having attorneys around. Well, so. I think I think it adds. You know, if if you have a good sense of fairness, and you know, we'll look at both sides of the uh, issue. I think attorneys can, and I I understand having going through estates and having dealt with a lot of attorneys in other modes. You know, yes, people do have different opinions of, of attorneys, but if you're not obstructionist, I think that that adds something to the uh, commission. So. You know, what what you said right. is pleasing to me. Well, Thanks. I look forward to doing what, what we can do to really help the town and help the commission. How do you feel about the economic scale? You said you were in this other venture that you talked about, the fifty million dollar. Well, that was in Texas. That, that was in Texas. Yeah. It was a, it was a, it was originally designed to be a two hundred fifty million dollar fund, and that the economics didn't work on that. I mean, the economic scale here is much smaller, I suspect. Now, I think that there are harder issues with at least forest fragmentation, and I don't see anybody here. But one of the things I find interesting is when we've been doing some of the regulations is, is trading zoning rights is an interesting idea. Once you put zoning regulations in place, the ability to trade, for instance, give away some rights. If you're a landowner in, let's say, in the Shoesville, you could give away on a permanent easement some of your land rights but you could trade it for somebody who might want to have a little bit more density downtown. Stowe actually has a provision in its regulations that talk about that. So you try to use different economic incentives and you try to give people assets that they can trade. And if you set it upright, what you're doing is, is you're, imposing, you're, you're either imposing a cost on someone, using someone that might fragment a forest or interfere with wildlife habitat, or you're giving them a benefit, an opportunity to save money by not fragmenting or by not inhibiting. Uh, habitat. That's what you're trying to do. Other than forest fragmentation and wildlife corridors, which you have mentioned, what other things do, that you think are key things that are affecting, you know, what the conservation of Waterbury's lands? You know, I'm new here, so that's a it's a hard question for me. Um, I, I think the big balance here is trying to figure out. Um, how to balance, and I think Governor Scott has done some of this already with Vorek, if I'm saying that right. Yeah. Try to figure out how to bring some, keep the economics growing here at a, at a level, call it a rate, that's probably consistent with what we could sustain. If it's too rapid, people are going to get very upset. We're going to overtax the infrastructure and we'll spiral out of control. But if it's too slow, we'll lose people. So mm -hmm. I, I see that balance as being very important here. Clean water is a big issue. Um, in Washington, D.C., we did a lot of, um, I didn't do work on it, but definitely a lot of reading on stormwater runoff. And I understand it's a big issue here yes, with the Friends of Winooski and Lake Champlain. 
It's hard to see that in Waterbury. You can see it around here because we have access to Linooski, but it, it, it's hard to see anything direct, at least from a newcomer standpoint. Thank you. Well, part of our discussion tonight is on winter operations and the use of salt and sand, and some, maybe some considerations as to how to reduce that usage to try to lessen the impact of the water systems. Yeah. That's, uh, so I've watched, uh, I used to, there's a tow path that goes between the Potomac River, a, a pretty prominent neighborhood in Washington, D.C., and, and, uh, and, and there's this path through there. And after the snows, you can see the water outlets, the storm, the, uh, all the salted water and all the melted snow, just thousands of gallons pouring right into the river. And we've, we've had parts of the Anacostia River that have been dead for years, so there must be some limitation. But trying to figure out how to do that is very difficult, particularly in an area here where transportation is so important. Yeah. You can't, I mean, you can't have the, the roads freeze over the economy, because people wouldn't be safe. So you have to think about it before you just stop putting salt on the roads, right? Well, it's, yeah. That's a double-edged sword. It's, uh, if you, if you, uh, If you go beyond the limits, I think uh, people become used to driving like hell during the winter and don't become trained to pay attention and slow down and do the things that they probably should do to be more careful. And being a native here, I've seen a progression of the salt and sand use over the years that has you know, become to the point of ridiculousness. Right. Uh, and there were, we were up at the state house there this spring, and there were guys from other towns laying into the Agency of Transportation Committee about, the, you know, the amounts of salt use and how egregious it is. And uh, so, so we're, we're going to have the discussion anyway. You know, an economist would want to look at the supply and demand factor. So if you start with just the demand for you know road travel, right? What you what economists want to do is impose greater costs on people tra uh, driving during snowy times when you have to sand. But I don't know if people travel 10, 15 percent less, you could actually reduce your sanding at all, right? They'd have to be you'd have to understand how that dynamic works. But that's typically the principle you want. You if you want to disincentivize, disincentivize people. I'm doing something, it, it's a tax, a form of a tax or a penalty or something. And I think politically that's probably a difficult thing to do, but that's when that's how you get people to reduce and change your behavior from an economist standpoint. You have an equity issue whenever you do that. My understanding is that in um, some of the carbon tax issues here, there are people along you know, the eastern part of the state worried that their businesses would just, customers would just go across into New Hampshire and just avoid the tax and lose the business. And there's a question of what do you do about equity when you tax people? The poor people might pay the most. It gets very complicated. So you can talk about the economic issues, but as an economist, I tell you, just put a toll up in the winter and charge them more. They'll drive less. You can get fired. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, something's got to change. We talk out of both sides of our mouth. We want to be all green and uh, environmentally conscientious, but nobody's willing to make any sacrifices. People don't think that it affects anything. I think it's a big problem. Yeah. I drove, I only went six miles, big deal. Why does that matter? And everybody, no one has, no one has an effect. No one sees that effect. It isn't sitting in their front yard when you put 100 pounds of salt in the front yard. Right. That, I think, is a big problem. And so people don't really understand the cost. I didn't get your name. I'm sorry, I was late. I'm Billy Victor. Oh. Well, I was on the Conservation Commission, too, and it seems that you do have some good skills, at least from what you explained so far. And you, do you have a background as a lawyer in D.C.? Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Chris, this is for a term, uh, three-year term ending April 30th, 2022. I think the Conservation Commission would be very lucky to have you in your unique skill set. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. I think uh, it's a good group. A little bit I've done with them so far. They're exciting. They're committed. It's, it's really good. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to working with them. Great. Yeah, it's great that uh, you're jumping on the bandwagon with the crew. 
Um, if there's any more, no more questions or comments, I'll take a motion to approve the appointment of Bill, what'd you say your last name? Victor. Victor? V-I-G-D-O-R. Victor. I make a motion to approve uh, Billy Vigdor uh, for the Conservation Commission for a three-year term. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. All those in favor, please you say aye. 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 All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks for the time. And Thanks, Bill. Leave you to uh, Thank you. Thanks. Matters. Thank you for your service. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Bill. You're up next. Notice of award of the Perry Hill Color Project is first. Yeah, so um, Carla reached out to you folks a couple weeks ago to we were talking about not having a meeting, um, and then the news hit about Jay McDonald and V Trans, um, and we asked if you wanted to talk about it. Um, McDonald was the low bidder on the Perry Hill Culvert project. This is a job that has been uh, waiting for, this is the third summer now since the problem occurred up there. This is the brook that's right between um, Upland Mowing and Perry Lee Road on, on uh, Perry Hill Road, just down the hill a little bit from where Mike Hedges lives. and. Um, you know, we had one of those big, uh, wasn't really a flash flood event, but it was a, a big gully washer in that culvert, which is very large for the brook that normally runs through it, uh, was damaged and the, the water washed it out. We've uh, worked with FEMA, it's got a FEMA number, and uh, we actually put a temporary culvert in uh, a couple summers ago while we did what the state required us to do uh, in this project, which was a uh, fairly significant hydraulic study uh, and then uh, go forward from there. So we were ready to do this work last year and uh, FEMA had uh, basically said it was a $75,000 project. We had a FEMA grant for that amount of money and all of the information that we were getting from local contractors was it was going to be significantly more than that. So we were back and forth with FEMA. So finally I asked Bill Woodruff last year, uh, late in the fall, to get back with FEMA and say, look, you know, this is, they classified it as a small project. And there's, there's a difference between large projects and the uh, procurement process and small projects. So I asked Bill Woodruff to work with FEMA and say, look, you know, we've got this disagreement, so how about if you just let us put it out to bid and we'll take the low bidder and if, if it's more than you think, we're going to have to figure out how to do it. So anyway, uh, we did invite uh, seven bidders to the, to the uh, we solicited bids from seven contractors. Uh, it was also generally advertised. We got three bids, um, I believe, and Jay McDonald was the low bidder, um, $150,850. Um, I don't have the specifications with me in terms of how big the pipe is, but it's, it's a big pipe. Um, and if you're familiar with that brook, um, it's fine 95% of the time, but it's very flashy. And when we get a lot of rain up in the Owl's Head, uh, that segment, you know, Middlesex Notch area, uh, it really rises up fast and comes through there pretty heavily. So we were all set with McDonald to go forward with the project. And then the announcement was made by VTrans about McDonald and um, their cutting corners on some other VTrans jobs uh, eight or ten years ago. And VTrans said, you know, we're not going to allow McDonald to bid on any more VTrans projects. This was all in the news uh, last week of August. So, um, 
I just wanted to make sure that the select board didn't have any issues with that. Um, you decided not to have the meeting a couple weeks ago where we really could have made a, a different choice if we wanted to. Um, but we worked with uh, FEMA to make sure that FEMA was going to be all right providing us grant money for this job. And uh, ultimately they said that uh, they were happy with our bid process, they were happy with the process that we used for design uh, and the hydraulic study, so they've given the blessing. So I would just like it in the record that you're that the select board is um, is confirming the award of this job to um, Jacob Cobb. I don't have the other bid quotes with me tonight. I apologize. Do you know what the range was in terms of the bid prices? What the highest one was? I, I don't, Jane. The next one? I don't, I don't Above have that. Above Jane McDonald? I don't have that with me. What kind of uh, oversight of uh, inspection during construction does the town have as a process? Well, is Al Bill the one Alec, that Tuscany, Alec Tuscany is a PE, a professional engineer, civil engineer, um, had been public works director here for 10 years and then for 35 years before that worked as a PE for Webster Martin and other firms. And so Alec will, oh, that's okay. will oversee it. Alec will okay, be the Alex. Okay. Are there any implications, Bill, of the states saying that they're not going to take no, any I mean, um, projects? Shifting gears to that, we can do this all at once, but um, the state issued a uh, press release indicating their, their investigation. Uh, it was on August 30th, I believe. Um, and they, I was on vacation. They actually included me in a conference call that, that day early in the morning to let me know that this was uh, be released. Um, from our perspective, in terms of the quality of work that is being done on Main Street, we frankly couldn't be happier. Uh, I did ask uh, Jesse Devlin and more importantly Tom Mancini, who's the lead um, inspector for VTrans on our project. And VTrans has six inspectors on site for this project. So it's not one guy trying to run up and down the road. There's Mm -hmm. There's several inspectors uh, working every day. So I squarely asked them, you know, is there any indication of any uh, issues with shortcuts, uh, less than workmanlike quality work, uh, no, no issues at all, everything is, is uh, going forward just fine. The issues that they had before were on bri bridge projects. This is not a bridge project. And right. as I said, it was a number of years ago now. In fact, the ownership of Jay McDonald was different at, at that time. Uh, so we do have concerns about it because this is a, it's a three construction season project. And I think um, from what I understand from VTrans and McDonald, <coughs> frankly, is that you know, about 60% of their work is spent with VTrans. So if VTrans doesn't let them bid, then, you know, that's, that's a big uh, gap to fill from their perspective. But from the perspective of um, a responsive contractor, one who has, in my estimation, as good, if not better than um, uh, anyone else, public relations skills, uh, they are very uh, responsive to the community. There's not every issue that gets resolved to the satisfaction of folks. There's some concerns being expressed about dust and things like that. Um, and, and they've responded, but the people that are complaining are still complaining. But, uh, you know, they have, uh, they have employees that if you're walking down Main Street, they walk with you, make sure that you don't step in a place that's dangerous, help you across the road. Um, so everything is going well 
from a public relations standpoint on this mm -hmm. job, and the work that they've done is is very good. So, I don't have any issue giving this to giving this project to them. Uh, we will watch them, not any closer than we would watch anybody else, I think. But All right. uh, I don't have any heartburn about going forward with this. Okay, thanks. Uh, question there: you, When you talk about the culvert, uh, do you recall whether the new culvert is a steel culvert or is it a concrete culvert? No, I believe it's steel. Okay. Um, as far as concerns about the workmanship, I think this, I think in lieu of the issues that are at hand with Jay McDonald, the spotlight is uh, pretty bright on them right now, and and I don't believe that they would do anything to uh, further jeopardize their reputation. So I personally don't have an issue with, with uh, them doing the project. Um, so do you want a motion to Yeah, I would just that? ask for a motion to confirm the uh, award of the contract to Jay McDonald for 150, 850, even. 150, make, that, make that motion, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just like to say that I think also the fact that the um, business was sold um, since the problem with those two bridges in southern Vermont is um, is important and also the town had a good um, uh, experience with them building the roundabout yeah, so um, I think that that and that happened since this problem and so I think that has a lot to do with um, continued support. So then you'll make the motion then, Jane, huh? I guess I will. <laughs> I'll make the motion that we approve Jane McDonald for the Culvert Project. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, second the Mike, motion. Mike Bard second it. Any further questions or comments? I'm not going to vote just because I came in late. So. Oh, OK. <laughs> all right. All those who wish to approve uh, the motion, please say aye. 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 Okay, Bill, consideration outside work by the manager. Yeah, this is a, this is a first for me, um, and I'm not sure if it's going to go anywhere or even if I want it to go anywhere at this point, but um, I told the gentleman that I would bring it before the board to make sure there was no issues, and then if there weren't, I would decide later. So anyway, the town of Johnson and the village, village of Johnson um, having a merger study and uh, they put out a uh, they had a vote at their town and village meetings I believe a year ago in the spring of 2018 to uh, have another merger study they have tried merger in the past just as Waterbury Town and Village did several times um, and they had hoped to get this project going, I, I think, early in 2019. What's held them up, I'm not sure. So I was, uh, I got a phone call from a gentleman by the name of Stephen Falbell, F-A-L-B-E-L. -E um, and he owns a company called uh, Stedman Hill Consulting. And, um, you know, he, he does, uh, you know, sent me his resume. He, he does this type of consulting for various government agencies. So he called me and he asked me if um, I was willing to spend about 20 hours of my time to review his work and to comment on some of the recommendations that he would make about merger. And when we spoke, I thought that he had already and awarded the job, and I thought that he had actually done most of the work and that I would be doing this pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, he said, this is something that will take a little bit of your time and, and uh, you know, I'll be happy to pay you for it. He said, but I don't know what I, what I want to, uh, you'll have to tell me how much it is. Um, if I do this, I don't uh, it's going to be outside my normal work hours, and I, I don't want to have to take the money that he might pay me and then reimburse the town for my time. It's If I do it, it's going to be something that I'm doing kind of outside work. 
I don't have an employment agreement with the town, but when I was hired 31 years ago, um, you know, I, I was asked by the town if that I were to do anything outside consulting like work that I would inform the board. And, you know, I think it's reasonable to, to, um, to uh, ask your permission to make sure that you don't have any problems with it. So when I got back to him, I said, well, I, I need to talk it over with my select board to make sure they don't have any issues. Partly will depend upon when you want my input because you know, if I get into budget time, I really don't have time to do this. Uh, so um, I asked him then, you know, uh, how soon before you before you're ready to have me look at your work, and that's when he told me, oh, they haven't even they haven't even awarded the job to any contractor yet. So this guy might not even get the job. So there's a uh, possibility that it doesn't even happen. Um, so anyway, with with that, I don't have a lot more details than that. I just want to see how you feel about it, and if there's any concern at all that you think that I don't have the time, then you know, no hard feelings, and I'll just tell them. So, so you'd have to have this pretty much wrapped up by the for beginning of December, or uh, mid-December? I, I, I know you get I, I don't know, Jane. Um, I know we started getting very busy meeting with you on the budget I'll, in I'll December. I'm getting very busy. It's not so much the meetings with you. It's the you know the fact that through the end of December and all of January, I work <coughs> seven days a week here anyway, you know, nights and weekends, getting ready for those meetings. Um, so it, it's going to depend partly upon, well, obviously if he gets the job, and then if he does get it, when he would he would. Uh, expect my participation. And if it's not going to work for me, just in my own right. life, I will clearly just say no. But I don't want to um, you know, lead him on or, or even think about it if the board would rather that I don't do it. So that's, that's all. So one quick question, and then uh, I guess another lengthier question. Um, there are merger. Uh, issue, is that similar to, I guess, the same circumstance that in, in problems that we had with merger? Do they have a police department that's separating uh, the two, or is it? I believe they have a police department, but I'm not sure it's the villages, it may be the towns. I don't, I'm not completely familiar. I know they have an electric utility in the village, which I've never worked with electric utilities. I know, you know, one of the issues that they have, and this is just anecdotal, but um, they have a small electric utility. Uh, they do, they don't generate any power, but they do an awful lot of, they, they do their own line work and, and the like. So they, they have to have linemen. And if you know anything about linemen, they're pretty highly paid uh, people. They don't have really enough work to keep the number of linemen that they have to have on to cover vacations and and everything else. Um, so they end up having the linemen, you know, shoveling snow and doing a lot of things they could pay a lot less for than that. So I think part of the issues are, you know, should they sell their electric utility? Should they contract with another utility to do their line work and, you know, and not have to have their own employees? So they, they've got some issues that are different than ours, Chris. But uh, like every town and village in Vermont that's ever existed, when they try to merge, there's always some issues that crop up. So there's nothing of, of in Waterbury's history that is of a delicate nature, other than you know maybe some litigation issues that would be brought into any of this discussion or anything like that. It's, no, I don't think there's. Any, I don't think there's anything in it that would put. Waterbury at any kind of risk of being exposed to any bad publicity or anything like that. Yeah. But, um, and how about your, yourself, just in consideration of you? Uh, I mean, I'm sure you're going to make sure that you're fully protected, that if for whatever reason they take your advice and it backfires on them, that they don't come after you or... Yeah, I'll, I'll have to... I'll have to Give consideration to all those things. You know, I'm not a I'm not a 
consultant, so I don't carry professional liability insurance outside of here. And if those kind of things um, uh, are significant issues, you know, I'm not going to do this if it's going to be any kind of uh, detrimental problem for me. And I'm certainly not going to go out of my way to, you know, spend money to, to do this for them. Uh, I haven't decided whether or not I want to do it, but before I give a lot more thought to it, I just wanted to make sure that if there were questions here or concerns that we have an opportunity to air, that's all. I see no problem as long as it doesn't interfere with your normal job. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key issue, and I, I think you, you've always been very respectful of that, so I don't think it's going to be an issue if should you decide to take the job. So we don't, we don't need to make a motion. No, right? I don't <laughs> think a motion is necessary. Okay. Um, select board items. I, uh, I, I do know there are some Ring Road uh, folks that we're going to show up around 8, so I don't know if we can do that to the end of the select board items. Sure. Unless anybody else got an issue with it. Okay. No. Uh, next on the list, then, is uh, roadside brush cutting. Um, I just wanted to bring up a point that um, it seems as though that the uh, at some point we would like to have some type of a schedule, if it's possible, to consider some roadside brush cutting again. Um, bought a new chipper a few years ago, uh, purposely to assist in, in uh, the cutting of and chipping of the brush along the roads. And I don't know that it's had too many hours put on it since we purchased it. Um, and it's just the road, the brush that's growing in on the edges of the roads starting to become an issue again. Um, and I know as well as anybody, you know, driving the, driving the big truck around. Um, you can actually, if, if you pay attention when you're driving down the road and look at the tree limbs sticking out into the road, you can see the bark peeled off from, from where other vehicles or other big trucks have hit them. And it's, it's, uh, it's difficult at times to be driving down the road with a fully loaded truck. You know, we've kind of gone over this before, and uh, you literally got to stay in the middle of the road because if you got on either side where you're supposed to be, you would either rip mirrors off or smash a window or do damage to the truck. Uh, so that presents a, a difficulty when you meet somebody on a curve or, or a hill uh, and there's no place to go. You either got to slam on your brakes and come to a stop until the vehicle passes so you don't wipe your mirrors and, and damage the truck, you know, in, in many spots on the roadsides. Um, so moving forward, I guess, uh, I'd like to see some consideration put into either maybe perhaps if the highway department doesn't have the time for it, if we have the if we have the additional funding, maybe they could hire somebody to do it for us. Um, do we know uh, what what commitment there is now to doing this work in the last year? This year, last year? I, well, I, think, to ask, um, I think there's been some of it done right. when the highway department is addressing other issues along a certain segment of road. Um, I do know that the greater operator has specifically said to me, it's a shame that the amount of brush that he has to put that $350,000 grader through just to grade the roads because the tree limbs are hanging over so far. But other than that, I don't think there's been any designated time to uh, actually go out and a couple of winters ago, I think we attempted to do some of it. But uh, maybe you can weigh in on that a little bit more. Bill. So we, we have a machine, but it's, there's no prioritization in terms of like well, a... Well, I won't say there's no prioritization. Uh, the challenge, of course, is there's too much of everything that needs to be done. We've got too many ditches that need to be cleaned. We've got, you know, uh, they're getting ready to 
to change out uh, culvert up on um, Water <coughs> Hill Road again, way up the top, because you know uh, rains are getting heavier and everything else, and that they continue to wash out. Um, you know, we've, we've tried to pick up the pace in terms of paving, uh, which requires some uh, brush cutting, it requires, you know, shoulder work. Uh, we're trying to do sidewalks, we're trying to do line striping and, and crosswalk painting. So it's just, it's not that nobody wants to do it, it's just what takes precedence, what takes priorities. and. I don't get into the, uh, you know, I don't get into the details of this type of work at my level. That's something that, you know, the highway foreman schedules. So all I can do and will do is, uh, you know, I had her in here today, and I drove around with her and showed her some things that were important to me to see get done. Uh, so. Potholes in various areas that have been there for a long time, some additional you know, parking signs, um, you know, stop down at the sidewalk project on, on uh, Butler Street, heard about some sidewalk issues on Randall Street. So, you know, we're trying to address the issues as they, they're all out there. And I think all of you understand that. Um, you know, we could work for a month of Sundays on a lot of different issues and not get, get it all done. So I will work with Celia and Bill Woodruff and, and talk about this issue and see what we can do. Um, I think the, you know, it's coming to the end of summer now and they're trying to make hay on some projects that they really have to do this brush cutting I'm sure is something that can happen during the winter months, uh, you know, uh, when there's not lawn mowing and other landscaping stuff and, and the like, and ditches and, and everything else. So uh, we will uh, we'll talk together and we'll try to push it up the list. Well, I'd, I'd just be aware of the fact that I'm not here necessarily complaining about it because I know we're up to our eyeballs. Yeah, I, uh, but it, I, don't, I don't take the it's, a, to your it's an issue that uh, I'd like to see if we can at least maybe attempt to, to deal with. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to offer criticism either in terms of prioritization, but I'm sure they, they have, a, um, the staff has a better sense than we do as to if they were going to do this, which roads might need it more than yeah, don't Don't worry about asking questions or saying, well, how come this or that? I mean, it's it's part of uh, yeah. part of life in the highway department. Well, the power company, to, to their credit, did a lot of brush cutting there for us here just recently. So um, that lessened the amount that the highway department is going to have to address. Um, can I, ask a, can I ask a quick question just surrounding, you know, this or maybe something very similar? <clears throat> As we talk about classes of roads, do those change the um, clearance expectations vertically and maybe outside of lane of travel as you change class? Is there any expectation of a certain amount of clearance road to first tree limb? No, I think, uh, you know, the, the classes of road are typically based on the, the volume of traffic that goes on those roads. So a class one road is Main Street. A class two road would be like Guptill Road or the bottom part of Blush Hill or even Union Street and Stowe Street, which are kind of um, arterial collectors that feed into those class one and uh, state highways or interstate highways. And then class three roads are pretty typically everything else. And uh, Neal and Flats is a class three road, as is um, uh, you know, Henry Huff Road is a class three road. And if you look at the, the uh, trees that line those roads, it's a very different circumstance. So it, it really doesn't have anything to do with the class of road. Um, some, some roads are just narrower than others, and you know, we've typically got a 50-foot right away. We, we don't use all the right away in most places. Uh, and I don't think people would want us to use the right away in most places in terms of having a 
a road that is fully 50 feet wide from the edge of the outside of the ditch to the edge of the outside of the ditch. And people don't want all the trees cut down in the town highway right away either. Um, but the, it's, it's, the issue is really for the larger vehicles and, and equipment. Um, you know, passenger cars almost everywhere um, aren't going to have a problem. And frankly, that's why we don't get so many complaints, because 90% of the people that drive on the roads don't know it's a problem, including me. You know, I mean, I don't think about it all the time. When I took a ride with Chris in his truck, I understand what he's talking about. So, um, but anyway, we'll, we'll uh, try to get some of the areas taken care of over the next few months. So Woodard Hill, that uh, the same big culvert there at the top, top is, yeah. is having issues again, huh? Yeah. So uh, we've we've temporarily fixed that, but we've they they're preparing to do that culvert work. I well, think put this some, week. So. Put some time into that thing the last time. I would have thought it held up against anything, but yeah. well, the state you know, is the state assisting us in any of that? So. No. Typically okay. on on class four roads, we don't get that kind of, we don't get assistance for that. We get some assistance now from the Regional Planning Commission on these connected uh, roadways that are connected to waterways. Um, so for instance, we're going to talk a little bit about we can use some of the money that we get from the Regional Planning Commission to help with stormwater runoff issues to, to make some improvements on Class 4 roads if we have to. I don't think that one on Woodard Hill would qualify for, for that money. Now, doesn't that abut the state forest? Yeah, probably. And, I'm sure yeah, right. uh, with the logging operations at the state frequents up there, I would yeah. thought they would. I don't want to say categorically it's not, Chris. Yeah. I, I'll check with Bill Woodruff, but I don't think it's, I don't think the other grant. Okay. So we'll move on to our next item then, which is the update on the roadside mower. I don't have a lot really to, uh, to bring this new to you. Um, after the meeting, uh, well, more than a month ago now, we talked about roadside mowing. Um, when we talked about roadside mowing, um, we gave some consideration to um, maybe trying to purchase from Fairfield, the machine that, that we used this year. Um, and I expressed, not concern, but we, we talked about some alternatives and an outright purchase of the machine. Um, you could invite some expressions of dissatisfaction from the public. Why are you buying a, a machine that costs um, you know, close to $100,000 without having the voter approval. Uh, one of the things I did look into is um, Fairfields would be willing to uh, lease uh, the machine um, and a five-year lease. Uh, and um, when you enter into a lease from a legal perspective, it's not a purchase and you don't need the voter approval. We talked a little bit about this with the municipal. Uh, uh, several months ago. So um, Fairfields is still using that machine. They've got clients that are using it right through into October. So um, I have not talked to them in a couple of weeks. Celia got some information. Uh, we could lease the machine for five years uh, with a payment of $20,230 and the first payment would be due on delivery. Um, and whether that would be something that we would want to continue over time, uh, I'm sure you could buy the lease out early if you wanted, you know, make a lease payment this, this fall, take, um, take possession of the vehicle, and then go back to the next year and say, look, we've got approval at town meeting to buy it, we'll just keep, you know, we'll buy you out. I don't know what the cost of that will be yet. Um, well, they would the, be willing to lease it. They would be willing to lease it 
up to seven years. Um, but uh, I don't know what the interest rate is on those leases or anything else. That so price was, how was that? That was a yearly annual price, the 20000 or what was? Yeah. yeah for okay. five years, and that's it. So you put in 100000 right. So a lease typically. So you're saying lease to own, so at the end of the five years we own it, or we, we pay lease on it for five years that and then be, there's a buyout the, at the end? That would be a lease and probably a buyout. I think that buying it outright is a better deal, Yeah. Um, but it might be worthwhile considering, and, and I would get some more information. The, the machine isn't available yet, but I can get some more information. Um, I think that it only makes sense to lease if you're concerned that pushback from the public at town meeting about buying something without their permission will be problematic. Um, you know, you can call a special town meeting if you wanted to um, and, and get authority to do that. We've got some other issues. Um, next month we'll be talking a little bit about the capital improvement plan, um, both equipment vehicles and um, highway infrastructure paving. Uh, we talked at the beginning of the year about the fire trucks. They're, they're no cheaper than they were before. So, you know, uh, there are, there is consideration that could be given to having a special town meeting if you wanted to, you know, get that um, uh, blessing from the public. But uh, I think you folks made a decision, all things being equal, that you would prefer to own the roadside more as opposed to rent it every year the way that we do and then have the ability to, to use it uh, a lot more often. Of course, if you use it a lot more often, it doesn't get driven by a robot. That's one less person to cut drives. What did we think our annual spend was? If Do you remember offhand? What we were for to rent it in the small windows that we were. It was like four thousand dollars a week or something. Yeah, I signed the order too. And I don't yeah. remember what it was, but we it was like it for a couple of weeks this year, and I think it was like eight. So maybe half of what we're talking about potentially, if we Close. were to even lease it. Yeah, about a third of maybe what we were talking about. So. Anyway, there's no action. I'm I'm right. not looking for any yeah, action sure. tonight. It's just that's what I've learned since. We talked about it initially. I would hate to have a special town meeting. You know, the I'm just even thinking of the expense of having a special town meeting. You know, I know it's not a lot, but it's another thing on the, you know, budget. Uh, I think it's something that can wait with a potential short-term lease that we could, you know, potentially then get approved at the next town meeting. Well, there's always the possibility too of finding another machine from another, that's from true. another dealer. Uh, that would be that would be available when the timing is right, right. for us to, you know, get voter approval. Uh, a lot of iron out there on the market right now, so yeah, totally understand. Nobody says we have to get it from them. Um, okay, so I think if we're Good on that. We'll move on to Question. one of one. Oh, Question. go ahead, Alan. Conservation Commission appreciated and noticed the mowing efforts completed by the Town Highway Department this summer. Um, they uh, increased some frequency in a couple places. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, turn it on. Okay. Uh, Alan The Conservation Commission noticed and appreciated the mowing um, effort and frequency completed by the Town Highway Department this year. They extended their mowing off the road quite a bit more than previous years, and there was a second pass done on a lot of places um, either at the end of June or early July. That was that was help, helpful for a lot of some of the herbaceous invasive plants that Conservation Commission's been noticing creeping around and owning a machine is gonna improve the highway department's ability to mow at their whim rather than being um, anchored by some rental agreement. So Conservation Commission would just appreciate any, any efforts that would 
improve their ability to, to mow, mow as needed. So. Very good. Thanks, Alan. Okay, I'm wondering if we ought to flip a coin here, which item we want to go to next. Uh, when we're in our treatment of the roads, may take a few minutes. Um, how many more people, Mark, do you suppose will be? Couldn't tell you. I don't know. Okay. At least two more. At least two more? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was on the agenda for 820. If folks don't mind waiting for the other folks that might yeah, be expecting it to be later. We were still that early. Okay, Zoom. then we'll move on to... Uh, we're zooming through. Yeah. We'll move on to the winter treatment of roads. Um, as we'd said previously in the, in the meeting, we were going to have a discussion about uh, the salt and sand use and um, what possibilities there might be to curb some of the the usage um, to try to help protect our waterways a little bit more and maybe cut back on the, uh, the uh, contamination of the roadside soils that I believe are contributing to the growth of these invasives. You know, it's uh, given the soils a different, different uh, structure than what's normal for typical typical plants to survive so the invasives are called invasives for a reason and they grow like wildfire in in uh, a lot of these areas so biggest thing is uh, you know our budget's been pretty impacted here last year's salt budget uh, was pretty uh, pretty hammered by the winter that we had. Um, and we had a discussion there at one of our prior meetings as to perhaps why some of the extra salt and sand gets used uh, during just checking the roads. Uh, I've had documentation in the past of sand over sand. Um, it just didn't make sense as to why some of these roads were being treated when they were quite passable under the conditions that they were in. So I don't know if the board has given any thought to this. It was discussed a while back. You know, the constant uh, salting of our roads during the winter is certainly deteriorating our asphalt at a faster rate. I know we got to try to keep into consideration the uh, safety of people driving on our roads during the winter conditions. And as time goes on, the volatility of the uh, climate during the winter is such that uh, sometimes the roads are a little icier than we'd like to have them. Uh, so I don't know what can be done to try to curb some of the usage. Uh, anybody got any suggestions? I know that uh, we had talked about possibly some of the flatter ways, flatter, flatter roadways being treated with a lot less salt or no salt at all, maybe perhaps sand on the corners and, uh, and hills and during certain types of snowstorms. You people know that snow, some of it's drivable, some of it's slippery as hell. During the colder, colder days when uh, they're putting, trying to put salt on the paved roads. The salt doesn't react very well and just turns into slush. Makes nothing but slimy roads, and that to me is just as dangerous as if you just left them and drove on cold snow roads. So anyway, uh, I'd like to hear some input from some of the other board members. I've thought about this a lot, and I think it's a big economic issue as well as a safety issue. I do think we have to be prudent for safety for the community members, but I think 
a lot of it revolves around people going too fast for conditions and do we have to be protecting people from from their own speeding I don't think we do I think uh, if people use prudent <coughs> driving measures we can use a significant less salt and you know this is otherwise you know I think the environmental effects you know are bad but I think the economic effects are you know everyone in our community will will respect that and I just think it's just it's a little bit of an education of how people need to relook at what they're driving and I think as you said Chris we probably need to look at the areas you know say the flatter areas in our community look at less salt there where are the hillier you know places that would get slick and you know a much more per you know potentially where someone will run off the road those are areas that you will have to apply some you know salt you know I don't know you know in terms of what other alternatives I think you're going to see in the future different alternatives to salt you know they're looking at a lot of that on roadways and I think a lot of you know just because of costs you know a lot of communities are running out of salt every year uh, because I think they are applying I think most communities probably do pl apply more salt than probably is what what's necessary but I think the community one because on an environmental level would be in favor of less salt but I think it, folks you know in, in their pocketbook it, salt really has a big impact on our budget and I think the combination is something to really look at less salting of our roads. I guess I feel like I need some data. I, I don't, uh, I live just down through 100, so I don't have a lot of um, observations um, to share. Um, but I, I don't know, have we increased our budget for salt? I guess I'd like, I think some kind of analysis would need to be done to um, address this. Well, salt, Salt and sand, as Chris indicated, are, are kind of directly proportional to the winters that you have, but it's harder and harder to, to figure out which is a better winter. Um, you know, if you have winter that it's always 32 degrees, you know, 30 to 34 degrees, uh, and you get a lot of precipitation, that's kind of the most difficult to handle because some of it falls as snow, some of it falls as sleep, might fall as freezing rain, uh, the slush factor comes in. If it's really cold, and if it would stay really cold, you can plow the roads off and you know the, the, the plow shoe is gonna keep the blade off the road uh, an inch or half an inch, three quarters of an inch, whatever it is. And then that will pack down. And as you all know, if you're driving and it's 10 degrees on snow, snow gives you pretty good traction. It's, it's when you're near the freezing mark is when you have the biggest issues. Now, in 2018, we budgeted $50,000 for salt and $52,000 for sand. So that's 102,000, well, 52,500. So that's $102,500 that we budgeted. We spent uh, $70,245 for salt and $51,676 for sand. So we underspent sand just a hair, and we overspent salt by, uh, you know, 50%. dollars $20,000. And this year we budgeted fifty-one five for salt and fifty-three for sand. So we budgeted back to the. 2018 level, um, part of the increase in price from year to year is an increase in the cost of the materials. You know, as like everything, things go up. Some years salt is in short supply. It all, mostly all comes out of New York State, the salt mines there. And uh, some years uh, it's 
harder to get than others, or there's more demand for it in other places. So the, the price is pretty variable. Um, salt, we, we kind of touch twice. So the salt comes in, we don't have a, a huge salt shed. Uh, you know, in places you can go around and see those big conical buildings that are salt sheds. We've got a, a one bay garage, uh, and in the worst kind of weather, we have enough storage for about a week to two weeks worth of salt. You know, there's not a lot of storage there. But the salt comes in, you push it in the garage, we put it on a truck and then spread it. And, and that's what we do. We move a little bit of it down here behind the school so the sidewalk plow can, can get it. So we basically touch salt once when we're putting it on, on the truck and spread it. Sand, um, you know, we're, we're touching that a lot. We have gotta get it in. A lot of the sand is hauled in by a private contractor, but we haul some of it in ourselves. We've got to put it in a pile, we've got to push the pile up, we've got to mix salt into the pile, and, and that pile gets lots of work uh, throughout the winter. And then we put it on the trucks, and then we spread it, and then we plow it off, and then in the spring we've got to go and we've got to sweep it all up. So um, I'm not sure, and, and I'm not the economist, I guess he left, so he left just in time. Um, you know, I'm not sure which is more cost effective. Certainly the other issue with salt is what it does to your vehicles um, and the like. So I'm all for using less. The question becomes how do you use less and where do you use less? We're going to, unless the board says don't do it, we're going to salt Blush Hill Road from Route 100 up until you get up near the top. We're going to salt Perry Hill Road. We're going to salt Loomis Hill Road. Uh, we're going to salt the heavy, you know, the steep portions of Byron's Hill. Um, those are just safety reasons. Now, some of those roads, not Blush Hill, because of coming down, is the issue with Blush Hill, where you want that, you want Blush Hill bared off if you can, because you don't want people sliding out onto Route 100. Um, some of the other roads, you know, you can use sand on those, but sand works well if it stays cold. If it gets slushy, sand isn't going to do much. Salt melts the slush, you know, that, that stuff off. So we can try, if the board wants to say we don't want salt put on flat roads, that's what I'll, I'll tell you. Um, but, you know, from my perspective, the people who are taking care of the roads, uh, many of them have been doing it for a long time, and I think they know the roads and how they, how they are um, affecting the traveling public. We don't have a bare, bare roads policy here, but um, there are places that salt and, and the like a lot more than than we do. So uh, there's no easy answer. I'm not sure if you want to craft one, I'll be happy to listen to did, it and pass it along. But did you, um, you gave us the, um, the budgeted and the spent amount for 2018. In 2019, um, in the, do we have a spent, how much you spent in, in the, that year? This recent winter? Um, I don't have it with me. Okay. Um, Do you think it was similar? Well, the the sand budget, the sand budget, um, we spend the sand budget mainly in when we bring. Regardless, the sand in. yeah. So we've we've got our sand for this winter, and my guess is it's going to be pretty darn close to the fifty three thousand dollars we budgeted because that includes getting the sand in here. We try to bring in whatever, 5,000 yards or whatever, whatever it is. Every year, not every year, but often this year in particular, I was being told by the highway foreman we might run out of sand, we might run out of sand. I've been in Vermont towns since 1982. 
Uh, I should never say never, but we've never run out of sand. We've never had to go break into the pit in you know, the middle of winter. Um, we somehow always manage to have sand. And there's enough sand that's kind of fallen down into the Phragmites below the, uh, the highway garage that if we had to, we could mine that and get sand, I'm sure. Do we have any data that the, same, the salt is really is is causing a problem? Is the amount that it gets I, used. I, I have no. I or have is no it within data. a watershed the area? I have no we're... data, Jane. I mean, I don't know if anybody uh, tests the salinity of uh, the, the brooks and rivers around here. Um, anecdotally, I, I know. You know just said a little while ago by the gentleman that's had over there. I know in New York State, some of the, some of the uh, lakes up in the Adirondacks have had significant uh, chemical uh, change in their, in their uh, water. And it's attributable to salt, whether it's really from that or not, who knows? There's acid rain and everything else that falls. So, so no, I don't have any data change. Okay, I mean, I'm sympathetic to the issue, but I don't, with it, without any kind of a little more analysis or data, I don't really know how we can. Yeah, it's it's act not any this. analysis or data that um, I can generate. I know. I don't have the wherewithal to. I, to I did, um, it, related to the slush versus, um, you know, cold snow issue, I did hear a presentation um, probably two years ago by um, this graduate student at University of Vermont about per, pervial, permeable, permeable pave, pavement. And he said that in Vermont, we had like a very, um, the freeze-thaw cycles were much greater than all other parts of the country, which makes it very challenging for those permeable pavements. So I guess that's, that's the only data I would know that we have a lot of that freezing and thawing and it can make it challenging and that's why you want to use more I salt. Think, I think, again, uh, the perception anyway is that we're having more frequent thaws and then right. refreezing. I mean, that certainly doesn't do any good for the paved roads because you know any crack that's in the pavement, if it thaws at all, or it just melts on the surface. It doesn't have to thaw below. But if there's cracks and water gets into those cracks and then it gets cold and freezes, obviously those cracks get expanded. So it's it's not great to have the freeze thaw cycle. On the on the back roads, the gravel roads, we typically don't put salt on those roads at all because salt would eat down through you you know, you want those gravel roads to be frozen as much as possible between the middle of December and the, the end of March because we all know what mud season is like and you don't want to, you know, we don't add salt there except a little bit of salt that's already mixed in the sand to help it um, not, not, you know, freeze into big clumps. I, I can't exchange, I can't cite any specific studies, but I know I have read studies. Look at the vehicles in Vermont and other northern New England states. Look at the vehicles in Montana, Wyoming, and other western states that don't use salt. Uh, they use predominantly sand. To me, it's very obvious the salt is rotting our vehicles away. Not only does it have, and I'm a fisherman, I know it does have, and you know, I can't cite here specific, but it, it has had effects on trout fisheries in, in New England. Um, salt is just not a natural thing in our, our environment, and it's probably not, put it this way, it's not doing anything good. Thatcher Brook, when I was a kid, was loaded with trout. You can walk that brook any given day and see them swimming in almost every pool. Um, the other issue we have with our roads is that, you know, some of our roads, and we've been working on trying to upgrade our asphalt roads as fast as we can and as fast as our budget will allow us, but um, 
Because of the roads, some of our roads like Maple Street and Guptill Road is getting to the point where it's going to be declining very rapidly here in the next couple of years, uh, that it takes a lot more salt to keep those roads clear because they're so rough and deteriorated. And that just accelerates the problem uh, because then the water sits in those holes and those cracks and they just get pounded to death. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting to try and experiment on uh, at least a couple of the flatter roads like Maple Street uh, for a ways there to get to the bottom of Barnes Hill. Um, Guptill Road's a, another good example of where we could uh, limit our salt use and maybe resort more to sand on a couple of the corners. Uh, and Neelan Flats for a long ways is just a nice flat stretch able to negotiate that with not too much problem. We got a lot of taxpayers in here tonight. If you want to weigh in on this issue, feel free. If you think we're out of our heads to try to uh, limit the amount of salt and sand use, then feel free to tell us. Or if you have some concerns about the impacts of it and uh, how it's, you know, I think we've kind of eaten up our a lot of our salt budget from this for this year from from last winter hadn't we uh, um, remember right we bid I'm into sure it we, pretty I'm good I'm sure we did but but our uh, we're on a calendar year so our our winter months are really January February and March and then uh, usually December now in 2018 uh, we got snow Old and snowy all throughout. So um, it's not unusual that the bulk of our salt budget is going to be used up in the first three and a half months of the year because we've got most of our winters in the first part of our season. So we've spent, I, I don't have it here in front of me, Chris, but I, I know we've we spent more in January through March last year. Pardon my ignorance, but um, I've never driven a dump truck before. So, I, is there uh, what controls our rate of application of salt? I mean, when, when a guy goes, guy or gal from our highway department goes out to, to salt in the winter, uh, is it just the speed of the vehicle? Is there a, is there a regulatory measure that so there's, can, a, there's a uh, there's a control knob. Um, you know, years ago, we had tailgate spreaders, and there was a there was a gear wheel on the outside of the, uh, the rear axle of the truck, and there was a chain and it went up, and there was a gear at the uh, on the tailgate spreader, and that. Control the auger. Would go and the auger would spin. If you went faster, the auger went faster. Uh, and uh, in the 1990s, that's when we we started buying the the spinners that were controlled in the in the cab. We have uh, most of our uh, smaller dump trucks still have tailgate. Uh, spreaders that are controlled with a little knob in the cap. There's probably two knobs on the thing. Um, and then the tandem truck has an under the body uh, sand uh, and that's controlled from inside as well. There are, um, you know, you can set the, the control that will, that will regulate how much salt goes out and they typically do that based on the conditions. There are computers that, and we, we had some, I don't know if we still have any, that uh, you could set a rate per mile and that computer would regulate the, the uh, spreading regardless of what speed you were going. So if, if you wanted you know, two tons a mile of salt, um, and I just pulled that out of my head, I don't know if that's close to what they do or not, but if you wanted two tons a mile for salt, You'd set that control, and whether you went 20 miles an hour, if you went 
40 miles an hour, two tons a mile would go out. But every computer has an override ability where the operator can say, well, there's not enough going out, and you know, it gets ratcheted up. So. Yeah, that, I mean, the state has an ed educational class that you can take to specifically on how to regulate your salt and sand use, but uh, when that was discussed with our road foreman, she basically said it was a waste of time because the guys are going to do what they want to do anyway. So uh, I think that can be taken care of. I mean, if, if that's really the case, uh, you know, you can we can find a way to say this is what you're going to do and if you don't there's an issue well, that's kind of what i was getting at it seems like this salt if we're going to manage the amount of salt that we're using right now on the amount of roads that we have to spread it on it seems like a management issue it, it well there has like, to be controls and ways to control it yeah i mean it, there has to be some kind of a an auditable uh, you know, number of miles of pavement and the amount of sand, uh, salt that has to go down on those miles of pavement during a typical storm. You know, it, it seems like we don't have a, a viable metric to, to go up against um, if we're going to try to uh, grab the reins on how much salt we're using. I think the, I think I'm not disagreeing with you, and there's a, there's a variable metric in place regardless because, you know, if, um, and it, it, I'm sure it can be figured out if we really want to, but there's going to be a difference between, you know, what happens in the, the village area versus what happens outside the village area because part of your application of salt also depends upon traffic because traffic across a roadway, even in the winter time, is gonna warm the pavement. And you put salt down and you want that traffic over it. And if you don't have enough traffic, especially if it's cold, you know, below a certain temperature, unless you have a real lot of traffic, it's not worth putting salt down at all. It's a, it's a decent enough uh, aggregate in terms of you know uh, preventing uh, sliding, but sand is a much more efficient way to prevent sliding in those areas. So if you don't have enough traffic and it's 20 degrees or below, you don't want to put salt out anywhere except in the village, maybe. So it, it's it's not just uh, you know everybody's exactly the same. We've we've got. Down here in the village, you're at 400 feet elevation. Up where you know where I live, you're at 1,200 feet, and up where Mark lives, you're probably you know close to 1,800 feet, or or well, not quite you, but some of the people who live up above. So. My my two quick thoughts on this are one, I think maybe a couple of us can meet with the highway department. I think they're going to be the, the experts on any changes that we might even want to consider for this season. I think safety for me is the biggest concern of any changes that we might do that puts the general public at risk because we might be trying to, if it's, it's, if it's truly about saving a buck and if, if there's a safety contingent to that, I, I, I personally have concerns without knowing exactly what those changes ultimately mean. but. Um, you know, the financial component to me, I think, is the long-term condition of the roads and what it's doing. I think, you know, the, a $20,000 overage on salt versus, um, you know, a road lasting five years less because of the salt usage over time, I think, is a, is a, is a viable conversation. Um, but I think one meeting with the highway department, with a, a few of us, and just talking through what they see and what they think, because you know, they might, no one's telling them otherwise, potentially, and they just are doing what they think is right. But um, I think that that's, those are important conversations, but they should be done with them. The other one is, is are there towns in Vermont that either A, have gone to completely sand, and how is that working for them? Or what other towns could we look to emulate, and just if they have policies or have been able to spend a budget on more of a, a controlled study on how they approach salt and sand and who's doing it right and 
and you know we're a smaller town but maybe bigger towns have the budget to bring in a consultant and they've done it and they have a plan and we can we can steal from those plans or or you know borrow those plans i think is worth looking into i don't know what towns we might need to look at to try to do that but i hate thinking that every town is sitting here having the same conversation about salt and sand tonight so i mean somebody's well, I, can, I can i can yeah. look into that that's and you know the, t the town manager is still fairly well. I think they have an alternative to salt. Uh, maybe you could check into that. I was, somebody told me that they were using something different. I could be completely wrong, but uh, okay. it might be worth And Bill, maybe you could look into it, because I know New York State has a lot of communities that have gone saltless. They've gone to, you know, just sand. And there's probably some data out there that would, you know, from, from from those communities, I, I I think it's a fairly significant number of them. I think well, some, at some is, point you'll see that the, you'd the be sand, forced to do that. You know, the, the sand is uh, probably better for your vehicle than the salt is. Right. But you know, lots of sand is no panacea either. No. They fill up ditches. They yeah. get into the streams and sediment. Um, you put too much sand on a gravel road, and uh, you know they're harder to grade. They're harder to to keep from getting muddy. Uh, they're harder to keep the integrity of the road the way they should be with the you know the the sieve analysis of of gravel. So sand is no panacea either. Yeah. There's no perfect golden arrow. Okay, we'll probably. I think it's a good idea to go talk to the highway people too, and maybe outside of this public forum. I'll set that suggestion. up. Suggestion. All right, we're going to come full circle back to the item on the top of the list, which is the status of the ring road. And it uh, looks like we've got a few people here interested in talking about the status of the ring road. Um, I had this put on the agenda because I just recently was doing a little project up there and uh, was a little bit concerned with the condition of the road being a class four town road. It's the town's responsibility, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, that we are uh, obligated to take care of the ditches and the culverts. Um, I don't know if there's any regulations stipulating that we have to keep the brush cut or anything like that, but I, from what I understand, it's strictly keeping the ditches and the culverts in good operation um, but I noticed that a lot of the ditches are now three quarters full of runoff from the ring road itself uh, the ring road has gotten to the point where it's a short section of it is gouged out so bad that I got to believe that during each rainstorm of any magnitude uh, a lot of the product that's on the road is ending up in the brook, nearby brook uh, because you can see that the ditches are three quarters full and I'm sure it's impacting culverts as well. Um, my concern was the fact that I do know that I guess outside of our realm of obligation we do put aggregate on that road especially during the spring and grade it uh, to try to deal with the mud issues. But what prompted me to put this on the agenda was the fact that the aggregate that the town is now spending money to put on the road is now in the ditch or in the brook. Uh, and the road has gotten to the point where it needs grading. I did contact the highway foreman and asked her, I said, you, I know you're up to your eyeballs. Uh, the ring road is getting pretty bad. Um, is there anything you can do to run a grader by it and uh, maybe bring it back to par uh, before winter? And she said, as I knew anyway, they typically do two gradings during the season. Um, but I'm wondering, obviously the highway department doesn't need more work. We're having issues keeping up with what we got already. But the fact of the matter is that even though that's a class four town road, there's a great deal of residents that are starting to be put up there and more to come. Um, 
I know from talking with one gentleman who just sold three lots in Waterbury Center, two of them were on the ring road. So, and the project I'm working on is for another residence. So as time goes on, there are other properties up above that are going to be developed. Um, eventually that road will be seeing as much traffic as a lot of our class two and three roads are currently seeing. And I'm wondering if it's to our advantage to be more proactive, the municipality and the highway department, to perhaps during summer conditions try to maybe grade it more often if we're going to continue to put aggregate on that road to some degree uh, to try to at least salvage it by keeping up with the grading because what's happening is now our obligation to fix the culverts and ditches is becoming an issue to that we're going to have to address. Uh, so I guess what I'm asking is there a possibility that the town highway department can be more proactive you know, we're going to have to do something with the ditches now, but after, if, if we can and do do something with the ditches, uh, rather than going to the expense of, because it's going to cost more to deal with the ditch work than it is to simply maybe run a grader up there once or twice more during the season. So I guess I, that's the reason I brought it up, to see what we could do to try to stem the the erosion of the road and salvage what money the town is putting into it now. So, I don't have any answers. At yeah, the I, moment. this is you know got put on the agenda. Right. I don't know what it right. meant, so I was not prepared to discuss it. Um, a lot of people here. Yeah, there's a lot of people here. You're welcome to come up to the mic, state your name, and talk about your concerns. Um, uh, hi, I'm Bob Olson. I, uh, I live on Bear Creek, which is off Ring Road. Mm -hmm. um, I have some pictures that uh, we took back in the spring after the torrential rain. Uh, a couple of them uh, right near a gentleman that's sitting right here in his driveway. Um, but anyway, if you want to see it, you're welcome to it. I have contacted Woody uh, about this a few times. Uh, and uh, his last response um, indicated that he had uh, had a representative Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission on site talking about funds to tackle road erosion um, and that they were going to try to run a culvert up. That was back uh, beginning of this month. Uh, that he, that he, uh, uh, culvert or a grader? I'm sorry, a grader. I, I yeah, misspoke. Um, and. Uh, yeah, and he said it may be possible to do limited ditching in culvert. So, yeah. and I know he's he's aware of the issue. Uh, he's come on site and looked at it. Um, I know that we we actually have been talking about this while well, we've lived up there for 12 years, uh, and we had Alec up at, at right right after we moved in, and a bunch of us that are several that are here. Because that's he's not so. so I'm not sure about it. Um, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, no, Bob. No, uh, no, no. And, you know, the ring road in particular and class fours, class four roads in general are, are uh, they're um, not an easy nut to crack for us. So in 1967, the state reclassified the town highways in the state. And that's the last time that the reclassification was done. And I won't be able to quote this exactly, but, but as I said at the beginning of the meeting, uh, classes of roads are determined basically by the volume of traffic that they carry. And class one roads are major arterials like Main Street. Class two roads are like Winooski Street and Stowe Street and Guptill Road, which are collector roads that collect traffic from the class three roads and then bring them into the state highway system or class one town highways. Class three roads are typically uh, the streets in the village and the roads in the town off of the class two roads. So Neal and Flats, Maple Street, Barnes Hill, Guild Hill, Shaw Mansion, Loomis Hill, uh, 
almost all the gravel roads that we have. It, it, you, you can have a class two road that has a lot of traffic on it that's gravel. There's fewer and fewer of those in the state, but there are some. They're, they're not sure there's any more state highways that are gravel, but route um, from, uh, from uh, North Stratford up to Canaan, uh, Route 103, I think it is, used to be a state highway that was gravel. So it has nothing to do with the road surface. <clears throat> Class four roads, we are required, and, and again, I'm, I'm just kind of speaking from memory. We're required to be able to keep those roads passable for a passenger car. Doesn't say to go 40 miles an hour, it just says the passenger car in the summer months. And we are responsible for the water courses. So if a class four road washes out in a flash flood or in a spring runoff, um, we've got to go and put that road back in shape so passenger vehicles can get across it. Uh, we don't have any obligation to grade the roads. We don't have any obligation you know, the, the ditches, certainly if you, if you don't keep the ditches clean, then you're probably gonna invite problems with your culverts. But the requirements on those roads are very, very uh, minimal from the standpoint of what we have to do. And the reason class four roads are, are class four roads is because back when it was reclassified in 1967, there were probably two hunting camps up on that road. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got the Middlesex Notch Road, which has some residents on it. Uh, uh, we've got Wooded Hill Road that has a bunch of camps on it. <laughs> There's a few other class four roads around. Um, but starting, especially in the 1990s, People decided, well, you know, there's better vehicles now, there's four-wheel drive vehicles, we can get up there, and more and more development occurred. And, you know, Paul Reed uh, did a lot of the development on that road, and Paul Reed pushed to have uh, the road improved. And we said, well, we don't have any obligation to do that. Um, well, we're taxpayers here, we should have uh, the town take care of these roads. Well, there's a whole bunch of taxpayers that live on roads like Harvey Farm Road or Pinnacle Ridge Road or the road that you developed up there off of, uh, off of Shaw Mansion that are private roads. And those are taxpayers as well, and we don't do anything on those roads. So the fact that people pay taxes on the roads doesn't automatically mean they get full service like you would on a class one, two, or three road. So I, I don't say this at all to minimize the concerns that you folks have. I've been up on, on um, Ring Road many times. Uh, yeah, I drive up there. I used to walk up there quite frequently. And you know, when I get called, I, I go up. Um, there's no simple solution. The concern that I have is that if you start doing something on one class four road that is significantly different than how you have other class four roads where there are, where there are homes, then what kind of door are you opening in other areas? I'll do anything that the board and the, the taxpayers allow us to do, but we have a highway budget and the highway budget has minimal, um, minimal accommodation for class four roads. And I know, I, I've been at the home of a gentleman who's had to you know, dig out the end of his driveway uh, several times over the past few years. And there's no question about it. The, the rainstorms are getting more frequent and they're getting heavier. And it's not just on your road that we're facing those issues. They're, they're on class two and three roads that, you know, we've spent a lot of time, again, on Shaw Mansion Road earlier this year. 
Uh, so there's no simple solution. We have a, a, a seven-member highway crew, and one of those members is dedicated to mowing lawns in the summertime. So there's, there's only so much that I can get them to get done in a year. Um, the, I mentioned myself at the beginning of the meeting before you folks came in, and Bob, you just alluded to it, uh, the uh, issues of degradation of the state's waterways has prompted the legislature to try to do something about stormwater runoff. And they have uh, delegated to the regional planning commissions and have provided money to the regional planning commissions that uh, provide uh, money to towns for highways with interconnected that are on interconnected waterways. And the, the brook that runs down uh, Ring Road crosses under Ring Road at the, at the bottom, and then it ends up you know, paralleling uh, Neyland Flats down and ends up into the brook that goes through the Davis Farm and then down to Thatcher Brook and ultimately down here to the Winners River. So that's an interconnected waterway, and we can use some of the money that we get from the Regional Planning Commission to address issues on that road. But it's, you know, it's a, I don't know, I think it's a $25,000 grant or something. And if you look at the map, go ask Steve Lott's speech to show you the highways that are adjacent to interconnected waterways. I mean, we could spend $25,000 in, you know, a space of, uh, you know, a quarter mile pretty easily. So there's not a lot of money there. So I'm, I'm sympathetic. I'm willing to work with the board, the highway department, the folks on the road, but understand what you do on that road beyond what you are legally required to do is going to then invite people from other class four roads to, act for, to have similar uh, treatment. Does this class four road have a lot more people living on it than other ones in town? Um, I'd have it to probably has more than, than, than yeah. other roads, but we Very have bad. other class four roads that have significant yeah. numbers of residents. There's at least 20 residences. Yeah, I just did the contact list today, and there are 19 right now. Yeah. Right, uh, and, 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 about, and again. About, uh, I say six, Bob Kazminsky, 660 ring. Um, there were probably, when we moved up, there were Five of us? Uh, full time. Yeah, right. full time. And, and, one, and of the th one of the things that, that I'd like to see, um, basically what happens is when the town comes out and they do, do the twice a year job, they come up and they, they drop material on it. Chris can probably speak to this uh, in terms of how much, how much is spent on the material. But they come in the morning, they may come up 9 o'clock in the morning, they dump some material on the road, they run the grader over it, and they're gone by 11 o'clock. And uh, usually, within two days, it rains. They don't, put the, they don't do the grader on the road prior to putting the material to, to fix all of the rivulets that, that are created. They just put the material on and spread it. Two days later, it rains and it's gone, and the same riv rivulets have been there for about 10 years. And I would like to see them, if they're going to do anything, don't put the material on, take the grader and go up and put some crown on the road and, and run it up one side and put it in the middle and run it up the other side and then smooth it out. I'm not sure there's material enough on that road where those rivulets are to grade. It's right on top of ledge and it's bony stuff. It, well, it's it, not gradable. It is, but it's almost useless to do what, what's being done uh, now. The other thing that has happened, and, and I know that uh, George Pierce has tried to address this, is where they uh, put in the, the bridge over, um, over uh, Bear Creek. They put a ditch on the right-hand side as you're going down, and it fills with water. And George's been out there trying to dig that thing out so it drains back into the brook, and it, it ponds. There's a pond right in there now, and it goes all the way around, and, it, and the water uh, fills up in that, in that uh, low spot, 
and there are potholes all along there. We put that bridge in? No, no, no. That's you, you, once you once you that, go on to Bear not Creek. That's not off. that's not town. Well, they yeah, they they, they did road. put a it's huge. Not there. Yeah, they put a huge culvert in. And oh. Yeah, there's that ditch. There's the ditch. There's the ditch to nowhere at the bottom of the ring road. Bottom of ring road. Right. Yeah. First break yeah. on John Singler side. Well, it's culvert. Yeah, it's, it's a culvert. Yeah, I know where he's talking about. There's, yeah. and I mentioned it to Woody there. There's. Yeah, basically. The ditch goes so far and then stops, and it just constantly pools of water there, and then the water runs across the road, and. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I understand there, there that. There are potholes in there, and the, and and when you when you're coming down the road, you go off over to the left to avoid the potholes and that rise there. So there's going to be a head on there sometime. Yeah. So. Uh, and I would say the other thing is it, where the where the road <laughs> flattens out, where it gets up to uh, Ripley Road there, those potholes have been there forever, and I, I'm just. Potholes are a real pain. Obviously, we know that they're a pain, but I'm just wondering if they take it down and, and try to deal with the crown of the road there a little bit. It, it's, it's flat, and the water just sits there, and when you go over it, it makes a pot. It makes probably, how many potholes are there? Yes, Two dozen? Yes, yes. <laughs> Two dozen. And uh, it's awful. So those are, you know, um, so I spoke. Putting putting material on the road right now, I, I would call what's being done there is it's cosmetic. It's cosmetic for about three or four days, and then it's. it's so I spoke to Bill Woodruff just a little while ago. Okay, he said there is an alternative, uh, but the alternative kind of lies in the residents that live on that Class Four town road. He suggested that there's the possibility that. If the residents wanted to spend the money to upgrade that section of road to town spec, that the town possibly take it over. Now, from Mark Fryer's house up to the cul-de-sac, well, from the bottom of the ring road to the cul-de-sac is the class or four town road. From Mark Fryer's to the cul-de-sac is the best condition of that entire road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you people would be interested in getting together as a group, getting some cost analysis done on what it would take, meet with Bill Woodruff perhaps. Well, this, is, this is what happened when, when Paul Reed's first started selling lots up there. Paul came to us. Um, what I was going to say a minute ago is that the town has a, a a highway ordinance and specifications. And it talks about um, the town taking over roads or upgrading roads. And it's in the ordinance that it's up to the residents of the road to do this. The folks on Pinnacle Ridge, at least three times in the time that I've been here, have come to the select board and asked the town to take over Pinnacle Ridge Road. And every time, the select board has pointed to the ordinance and said, if you upgrade the road to meet these standards, we'll take it over. Uh, we did that with Upland Mowing. Upland Mowing, which is off of Perry Hill Road, um, um, yes. just over near where this culvert is, Upland Mowing was a, a private road. And they came in and said, we want the town to take this over. We worked with them. Uh, Renier Engineering helped them. They upgraded the road. They put the requisite gravel in, they put the requisite slopes in the curves and everything else, and once they did the work, the town took it over. So, um, but when Paul Reed came, uh, you know, that was communicated to him as well, and it was like, well, we don't want to do that. We don't have, it's, and I think, you know, it would be a costly affair, I believe. Um, and we made an agreement at that point that the town would significantly upgrade that culvert uh, at the bottom, you know, when you come in off of Which Ripley Road and yeah, go down the dip, that. Uh, that culvert the there was, <laughs> was much smaller than it is now. It had washed out a couple of different times. But my guess is, and I don't know this for certain, but part of the issue of more water coming down the road is that there's more development up there. And the more water, you know, it's not landing in the forest anymore. It's landing on people's and driveways, and it all comes down. So um, we did 
significant work in the bottom of that road. Uh, I think, Bob, that was probably around the time that you moved in, maybe shortly yeah. before that. Yes, the uh, when you get mad. Yeah, you should be. Uh, oh. <laughs> Ann gets mad when you're not. <laughs> All right, so yeah, right after we moved in uh, in 2007, uh, they, or actually before 2007, so around 2005, <laughs> I don't know who did it. I thought it was Paul, actually. Changed the ramp going up to Ripley. So from Ring up to Ripley, that was a rather steep. Yeah. He did that work. We, okay. we put the culvert in at and then, where the brook comes in. Yes, and then, and then I think it was around, uh, that was about 2004 maybe. 2007, um, uh, the highway department put in, it took out the existing culvert, put in a much larger, I think it was a double pipe culvert, which was getting plugged all the time, put in the much larger one. But soon thereafter, it's developed the problem that Bob was uh, also talking about, the ditch not kind of going whatever. Uh, but yeah, so that was done. Uh, Dave Grenier tells me that the town at one point also did the section of road up from what is now Mark's house to the turnaround. And he said that was 20 or 30 years ago and they widened it from a cow path to what it is today. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much the history, of, yeah. I don't remember that, but I trust Dave's memory, yeah. so I'm sure it was done. Dennis. Um, Dennis Plant, uh, 362 Ring Road. Uh, Bill's been at bottom of my driveway uh, more than he cares, more than I care <laughs> for him. Um, I'm actually a retired physician, and I remember speaking to either Bill you or Bill uh, uh, from my office, uh, wondering where the culvert was at the bottom of my driveway. I said, are you where it says 362 Ring Road? And, I sa and he said, yes. He said, you're standing on it. And it was just completely gone, full of sand. And that cost me $1,200. Um, to get it sucked out. Um, so I have no interest in having to repeat that uh, event. Um, earlier this year, it also got completely uh, filled up. Fortunately, um, it, there was uh, some branches that plugged that up and, and with the crew uh, coming, we were able to uh, clear that up and the culvert was not plugged. Um, it just um, had a bunch of debris uh, that was a problem. Um, in, in my opinion, there, there's, there's, there's an inter, interval solution from do nothing, which is what people have been complaining about, to a, a complete get it up to class three road standard. And that is the, the main problem is the narrows, which is just before Mark's place. That's the place where there is the bottleneck. That's the place where there's the problem. That's where the runoff occurs, which ends up A, in my driveway, or all off to the side of, of the road. Um, we walked that area last year and this year. Last year and this year, I was told, we really need to put another culvert in that area. Um, now, if there was a, a culvert in that area, to divert all of the water that's coming down on Mark Fryer's side of the drive of that road, all of that water has nowhere to go except to the bottom of my driveway where it hits a culvert, my culvert, and then there's a cross road culvert that if it's unplugged will divert some of that water. We need another culvert above my driveway um, right next to Mark's, I'm sorry? It's really small and it's up further, okay? We need one halfway down to divert the water. Paul Reed, rest in peace, said, to save this road, you gotta get the water off the road. You gotta get it into the culverts and then off the road. If it's staying on the road or staying in, uh, not getting to the culvert, it's gonna continue to deteriorate the road. And yes, the culvert, the, the ditches have filled in with the stuff that's been washing off the road. And yes, the, the, the town has a responsibility for the ditches, um, but you know, the ditches could get cleaned out. And unless there's a culvert there diverting that water, we're gonna keep revisiting the same problem. And I'm, again, my driveway is right at the bottom where this 
pinch point is. And you put the culvert in, it's a nice big culvert. Um, it, it works fine. Um, we gotta keep that culvert at the bottom of my driveway from plugging up. We need, if we had a, a diverting culvert across uh, the road, right where halfway up to where Mark's place is, we can save a lot of that runoff problem that's occurring at the Narrows. I think that's the main place where people are concerned about with Ring Road. It's just above my driveway. Unfortunately, I don't have to drive up there, so I'm not like, you know, uh, concerned that I'm gonna go off into the big ditch um, on one side or into the culvert uh, ditch on the, on the other side. So um, an, an interval solution is getting a crossroad culvert there, which is, I spoke to Celia this year, she said, we'll see about if we can get a culvert up there this year, you know, can't make any promises, or she told me last year, we're gonna get to it, um, but it, it, it didn't happen last year because it ran out of time. Um, she told me it was gonna, we got it budgeted for this year, and it, it, it hasn't happened. Um, that, that's a short-term solution to a chronic problem that would do a lot to preserve the, uh, the, the function of, of ring, wor ring, ring road. Um, a separate issue is getting it up to a class three road. And I think, I'll just speak for myself, but I think we would be interested in seeing how much it would cost um, to, to make that happen. Um, you know, um, we've got expensive houses up that road. Right. If we all had to pitch in, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, if, if we all had to pitch in, you know, $5,000 or $10,000 to get it up to a class, four, a class three road that the town would then take over, we may be worthwhile, that may be a worthwhile investment. If it's $50,000 a household, I think that's a, that's a separate problem, okay? Uh, if you can find funding from state grants, um, that- there's no, there's no funding for, except for this stormwater, uh, that I spoke about, there's no funding for class four roads. And I'm, that's why we, you know, we're not required to maintain them. Right, right. and I understand we're in a catch-22 on, on that one. But, so, uh, um, you know, this is uh, a highly used and highly valued class four road that the do-nothing strategy is gonna continue to create lots of frustration uh, an interval, interval solution, getting a culvert across the road to divert the, the water from rushing down the side of the road would be, uh, I think, valuable. Uh, and cleaning out the, the gutters that are plugged up would also be valuable. Um, in terms of the priority, getting the, the water diverted, to me, it makes much more sense than cleaning out the ditches. So, Dennis, to your point, um, the town is strapped for time, strapped for budget, and so on. The frequency of our storms that we've been having have created excessive amount of problems that the town has to address. They're, they're jumping around, putting out fires wherever they have to. If a culvert, if, it's, if you're suggesting that one culvert would make all the difference in the world, uh, <laughs> if I were living on that road, that culvert would be in. In other words, there's 20 residents up there. If one culvert is the issue, you know, the town can't get to it. I would suggest that you get somebody to put, put the culvert in and, and maybe solve a, a bigger part of the problem. Uh, in other words, I, I would just, I guess this is how I'd put it. I wouldn't wait around for the town. I'd do it myself. Uh, <laughs> it's recorded, by the way. Yeah, I know it. Uh, and and to the bigger point, to the bigger point, um, you're right. If if the group was willing to get together, talk about, and get some estimates to have that road upgraded, uh, you know, get the specs from the town. Um, Pretty expensive. Yeah. I, Upgrading to a class three is you don't is you don't expensive. know until you ask right uh, what the results is and and for future owners of property up there 
if they're going to contribute, help contribute to this, if there's going to be other property sales that are going on up there, maybe there's some form of a reimbursement every time a new resident comes along up there. If the 20 residents there now foot the bill to have the road upgraded, down the road there might be 30 or 40 residents up there. And over time, if it were possible, in that as a group would have to put this deal together that reimbursements would take place once somebody builds a new home. I mean, to go back to, to pay pay you people back for a portion of what you've expended. Bill, is there a limit on the twenty five thousand in terms of when it has to be spent? No, it can as long as it's that, as long as the Regional Planning Commission folks determine that it will be beneficial for water quality, we can spend it. But there's the there's the kind of the catch twenty two is that I don't remember the name of the road right across the road from me, but I live up on Ripley Road, and stagecoach. Uh, no, I don't think it's stagecoach. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, no, it's um, Wood, Woods, Woods, Farm Woods Farm Road. Road. Woods yeah. Farm Road. So. So there was, there was land there that was just as undeveloped as the land that you folks live on. And somebody decided that, hey, I can sell lots. They had to build the road to do that. And they built a good road. It's a road that has switchbacks, it's got ditches, and everything else. So the developers of the land decided that we're going to develop this land. We're going to sell these lots. We need to have access to the land. And they got it. You folks, and I don't say this, uh, I don't say this condemning you, but you folks said, well, this is a town road. So we're going to build on a town road. There was, you should have had no expectation the town was going to do anything more to that road than ever was done before. And if Paul Reed and other folks there had decided that, you know, we want to sell lots of here, we're going to develop this road, they would have done that. And it's, it's I understand from your perspective, you pay, you know, you pay property taxes. Uh, you pay a lot of property taxes. You have nice homes. But you're, you're kind of suggesting that Everybody else in the town should build the road to get to a place where the town had already chosen that it wasn't going to invest in that infrastructure. So uh, it's just a, it's a little bit of a challenge. And, and um, you know, I wasn't as brave as Chris was when, when the doctor was talking that, uh, you know, Put the culvert in. If that will solve the problem, you know, take care of it. Because that's what typically folks who want to develop on class four roads do. So I'm not sure we're going to get to it this spring, I mean, this fall. Uh, we've had issues. We, we have rain. It doesn't just fall on Ripley Road. We've got other roads that we're trying to take care of, and, and we're running out of time. Uh, I know that Bill talked to me, Bill Woodruff talked to me about three weeks ago and said that he'd been up there with the, with the people from the Regional Planning Commission. So we can do it. So we can probably pay for this culvert. It's, it's a matter of are we going to have time this year to do it or not. And I, I can't promise that. So George, i got to let Jack go before you, OK? He was. Well, I'm, I'm real quick. Yeah. Matt Nickerson from 390 Bear Creek. And Number one, thank you for bringing, bringing this up. Putting some time into it, appreciate it. I think we all appreciate it. Um, I think we met one or two things. I talked to uh, Bill the other day as well. And he told a lot of this through emails. There is a minimal amount of work that you can put into it. And I think that's maybe what we're looking for. If there's something right now, a minimal amount of investment, or some infrastructure we can do on the road to save the road, because you've seen the narrows, Chris. You've been up there almost every day. The narrows, we're losing the narrows. Yeah. You know, you almost can't even get one car pass. And that's the issue that I think we're trying to approach for just for today. I just want to say thank you for bringing it up. And, George. and, and I'll talk to Celia and yeah. Bill tomorrow to, to see if, you know, there's something that we can do more quickly. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll do what we can. Go ahead, uh, George Pierce, 741 Bear Creek. Um, I, I think I mean, the town seems to be making its position clear, and I appreciate that. And it seems consistent with the message we've been getting before. The variable, I think, for us as a group of neighbors to be able to take this any further is to get the information on what would it take to get it up to a class three. Uh, now, I don't want to speak for the board, but the message I got was that if you get it to a class three or it could certainly be discussed before you invested in it, the question of the town taking it over is something you would know before you would go ahead. Would we, anybody would go ahead spending a whole chunk of money. Uh, but how much is that money and what is the spec that we have to meet? What's the best process for getting the answer to that question? Well, um, anybody who wants a copy of the, of the highway specification ordinance, we can get that to you. That's, that's not a problem at all. Uh, I think that the, the best way to approach that, and I don't want to kid anybody, it will be expensive. The folks, if you know anybody on Pinnacle Ridge Road, uh, that development there. Those roads are significantly in better shape than, than, than the ring road is. And they have chosen not to do what's necessary because they feel it's too expensive. Uh, you know, uh, I think the ordinance was written before I came to town. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that it was written in a fashion to prevent this from happening because it has happened. There have been places that did it. Um, I think Perry Lee Road was built uh, by a developer and then turned over to the town. That happened before I came here in 1988, however. But that road was, I believe, turned over to the town. Um, and I know that um, Valley View Road over to Shaw Mansion and Steele built that road and that road was turned over to the town. I'm not sure that may have happened before the ordinance and then I, I already told you about um, Upland Mowing has, has happened. But I think the best thing to do would be to have a, a couple of you maybe meet with Alec Tuscany. Alec, if he didn't write the ordinance, was instrumental in its writing and Alec when he was public works director was the one that worked with um, the folks from Pinnacle Ridge when they ultimately decided not to do the work and with the people at Upland Mowings who did do the work uh, to bring it up to standard and clearly my recommendation to the select board would be if any road is brought up to that standard we'll take it all. I mean I don't think anybody here would say Oh gee, you did all that work, and now we're still going to say no. I, I think it's pretty much a automatic. You, you build a road to the standard and turn it over to the town. The town's going to accept it, which is a challenge because then we just have more road that we have to maintain as a class three road. But that's a whole different issue. But I think that talking with Alec directly and reviewing that ordinance would give you the best idea about how complicated and how costly it would be to get that up to class three standards. I, mean, I think if we can get a ballpark on cost, uh, even if it's you know pretty broad range, it at least gets us closer than looking at a lot. You know, it's it's uh, it's, it's hard to make too much of a decision. Yeah. Well, or even what you know, because we don't want to go on a full fool's errand either. Yeah. Alex, uh, Alex yeah. the PE, and he would be able to. You know, better than anyone else here, be able to, you know, give rough estimates as to, you know, materials that are necessary and, and the like. So I think looking at that ordinance and talking to Alec would be the first step. If you're really serious about that, I think that the other more short-term issues that we're talking about, I'll talk with Celia and Bill tomorrow to see, okay, we were up there in the spring, I remember it, uh, and I remember uh, one of the times that I went up in the spring, the highway crew happened to be up there already when I got there. They, 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 did some, they did some work there. So I will ask Celia what the, you know, what the likelihood that we can get up there and get that uh, area, the narrows, as you call it, uh, looked at this year. 
but uh, no promises. Yeah, the other consideration too in this whole issue is uh, the money that you people are spending on that section of Ring Road from there to the cul-de-sac just for winter maintenance. You know, if the town takes that over, uh, that cost kind of goes away for you. So you can consider that when when you're looking at the upgrade as kind of a payback. Oh, sure, go ahead, state Lake your name. Lake Kaspinski, okay. 60 Ring Road. Just two little comments at the end. One, we live the cul-de-sacs on our land, but from there up, we pay for the plowing and sanding of our road. Right. Nobody does it. It's, it would be nice to have that included <laughs> by the town. That's an expense. But more, just keep in the back of your mind, if you haven't seen the Narrows, go up there and look at it. Somebody's going to die up there. Seriously. In any season. There's so much traffic. There's a lot of trucks. People try. But remember that when you're thinking about what could we do about this road. Thank you. Yeah, I'm in third gear when I go up that road because I never know what's going to come flying yeah. around the corner. Third gear. You're supposed to be in first line. <laughs> yeah, well, we have a sign that says one. Just about. <laughs> well, uh, Dan Brady, 1045 Ring Road. Uh, what I'd like to go back to is a comment made at the beginning. Uh, I believe about the classification and how it's determined and part of what you had said was the amount of traffic on the road and so how much how many residents there are how many potential residents um, Bob has a list of 19 residents that actually have homes but that isn't everybody there's two honey camps behind our house uh, there's a number of other properties, so, you know, who's actually looking in to see, at some point, these Class 4 roads, based on those specifications that the state laid out in 1967, when can that be changed? There's not a trigger mechanism, is there, Bill? No. Uh, you know, I, I was, I was uh, you know, eight years old in 1967, so I, I, I don't know. The, you know, from the perspective of municipalities, it's been, that's a class four road, and we really don't do anything except make it passable for a, a passenger car. Um, I don't think there's any um, trigger mechanism, as Chris, Chris said. Um, certainly the town itself could choose to make that a class three road. There's a, there's a process in state statute that uh, allows towns to lay out roads. Uh, the town, if they chose, could discontinue that road if they wanted to. Uh, that would be more difficult to do with 19 people on the road who would object to it, but it, it is possible. Um, you know, and we've been through that process in the past too, where we've, there are some class three roads that go from you know, the highway to the milk house of a former farm. And, uh, you know, if you go up Perry Hill, there's a road called Town, Town Road, which is right near where Al Lewis lives. And there's a little short stretch that goes up the hill. And back in the 90s, we tried to discontinue that road so we wouldn't have to plow it. It's somebody's driveway, in effect. But there was objection, so we still, you know, we take care of that driveway, really, as a class three road. So there's, I don't think because there's 19 houses now, it automatically just becomes a, a class three road. The town could reclassify it if it chose to. Um, my recommendation would be we're not going to choose to do it because it's a, it's a lot of expense and we don't seem to want to raise the tax rate. Right. So, um, anyway. Amen to that. <laughs> Mark? Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Um, thanks, Chris, for putting this on the agenda. <laughs> I didn't actually do this. Um, I've only so been up there three it. years, and I think the one thing that I was hoping to get out of this was an understanding of, you know, I've been on the board for quite a while on a Class 4 road, now living on it. I have a, not as much understanding of expectation. So after we had that pretty good washout that I'm, I, I saw many roads around town and knew of many roads that we were working on, 
Um, you know, Ring got regraded, but really little to no ditch work was done that I saw, especially in the section that I live. Um, I feel like a lot of what we're uh, talking about today lives in those ditches in terms of how exactly they're built and how they drain. And um, even back in that one section at the bottom that they were talking about um, that kind of turns into the pond, I feel like if that ditch, I've seen some of my neighbors out there trying to fix the ditch, but I really feel like if the town came in with the equipment they have and, and uh, re-pitched it back towards the culvert that's there, a lot of that would potentially go away. And I guess, you know, the comment, the comment was, well, for the, the culvert up, up, the up the street that we're talking about maybe adding was, well, if you guys think that's a solution, you should go do it. But then, Bill, the comment is, is, well, maybe we can figure out how to do it. And I think we're all in the position that we'd love to not pay for it if the town's willing to do this work and, and do some of the work. And, and where do we understand where the town starts and stops when it comes to things like ditch work? I think. We, you know, I'm on an email chain with, with my neighbors and we'll say, well, maybe we'll send out a, a grader to, to deal with this. But then the question is, is should the town, so like, where is, where is that? Like, it's, to me, it's too gray. And, and maybe that's just a, something that's gonna continue, but you know, it, it would be really helpful. And I think I would like, as not only a select boardsman, but a resident to understand what the expectations are so we know and then I don't know, like, if we want to go dig across a road and put a culvert in, is that just, a, are we free to throw one in wherever? Like, where, where is the line? I don't, I don't know, you know? <laughs> Maybe we're just going to fill the road with culverts. I don't, I, don't know, like, I don't know. I'm just wondering, like, I'm really not trying to be it's, too it's comfortable really better, about it. But. It's really better if the town would put the culvert in. I, I mean, I appreciate, and I had the same thought that Chris did, that if it's that critical, just go ahead and do it. Um, you know, Mr. Plant said something uh, about putting a culvert across the road above. There's no question that that would probably help, um, but and, and I could be completely wrong, but it's, it's not going to be easy excavation there. It's, it's pretty bony material. To call what's on the right side of the road going up as you get toward those narrows, to, to call that a ditch is a little bit of an overstatement. There's really not any room for a ditch. There's the, the road and then there's this slope that goes up the hill. So, you know, keeping ditches, uh, real ditches in place in a steep, a steep slope like that area, you know, the state standards now is going to tell us that we need to have stone line ditches there, probably. So it's, it's not just easy to take care of all that stuff. Um, I understand your question, Mark. I don't have an easy answer for that. Um, I think the first time that we talked about it, I told you that, frankly, it would be easier to put a water bar across that road than it would be to put a culvert in there. But, um, and that would take the water from one side of the road to the other, and there's a, a bump that you got to negotiate. But you know that's how we handled the water on most of those roads most of the time when there were just hunting camps up there, as we just had water bars across those. There's roads. plenty of water bars in that road right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do they go the right place? Natural ones. I have a question. Maybe uh, Chris can answer this. But on that on that right hand side, as you're going up the narrows. If they ditch that, I see this, this, these rock, this rock, all over the town. Yes. You put it in the side of of the in the ditches. If that was dug out a little bit and you put some some, I, I guess cobble size or rocks in there, and fill that up, that would slow down the velocity of the water in that drainage ditch. It would it would slow it down a lot. And it would, without putting a culvert in there, the other thing it would do is when the when uh, Walker comes up and plows the plows the road for us all the time, that ditch is primed for all kinds of vehicles and trucks. They pull off to the right, and there they are in the ditch. And you sit there. 
and, you, and AAA has to come and pull them out. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, you know, and, and people don't know it's there. And that rock would keep people at least from going down that side. So the, here's, the, here's one of the drawbacks to spending the money on that rock. Uh, the excessive amount of sand that has to be put on the ring road uh, yeah, to keep it passable, the yeah. stones becomes yeah. useless after the first season. Um, my suggestion about the culvert was only in lieu of the degradation of the road and the time frame that it might take for the town to get there, it seemed like a uh, simpler solution to try to mitigate a, a bigger growing problem, you know, just to go ahead and put the culvert in yourselves and, and maybe solve some of the degradation of the road or at least slow it down a little bit. The narrows are an issue. Uh, I don't know what type of material is in that embankment, uh, you know, everything on Dennis's property is nothing but bony gravel. You now, whether or not that carries up through along that embankment, there may be some benefit to, uh, to whoever you hire to take that material out of there, depending on the type of material it is. Um, they could use it for a road base or some other use, so it might not be a total loss there. Uh, but if it's just crap, uh, I know they had one telephone pole put in there on that embankment. They had to shore it up there years back because it was going to, okay. the soil was so lousy that the pole was going to tip over. Uh, he tried uh, the, the guy you bought from. Riley. 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 Yeah. Riley. He, it really wasn't shored up. He just put a piece of pressure tree wood there. Two by six. Anyway, the real company didn't do that. Just to get it on the record, too, the one thing I noticed this summer was, I don't know if it was uh, just past my driveway, the section of the road that actually maintains pretty good. I don't know if it wasn't crowned well or what happened, but it was, had already been graded once, I think, this year. But when that pretty large rainstorm came, it didn't fall off the sides, it, it rutted out the center and missed the culvert and then took all that water basically down. It did a big rut right by my driveway, but then I think continued down some of that narrow, which really saw some of that degradation of the, uh, of that, um, what we're not calling a ditch, but a ditch <laughs> section. Um, so, you know, if, if the, if, if that, so again, my question is, is, is there an expectation that the town crowns that section of road and if not, do we need to, I, mean, I don't, I just, again, want to understand exactly what we should expect. And, and I think we live up there, we can see and probably have too many solutions, but I think there are some relatively simple solutions that potentially could avoid some of the more major problems that we could see down the road. So the town's not obligated to, as Bill had said, to put material on that road. And if there's not a proper amount of material, Putting a crown in it is almost impossible, and that's where part of your problem uh, comes in. So when I go up that road, nine times out of ten, I reach down and I grab the lever, and pull my truck into four-wheel drive. Because if you allow your truck vehicle to go up that road in two-wheel drive, you just turn up that aggregate that's there and and disturb it, and then when the next rain comes, there it goes. Bye bye. Um, I do that on almost any steep road wherever I am during the middle of the summer. I'll pull, if I'm up on across a hill, I'll pull it into four wheel drive just to try to save the road. And the other thing is, where possible, you try to drive not the same place all the time. Uh, try to beat the road more, more evenly, huh? Spread the wealth, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Because once you start wheel tracks, that gives the opportunity for water to travel in in that and that's you know so there's a lot of factors involved in the reason that road is going to hell um what i was trying to do was to see if we could get the town up there to try to mitigate the problem sooner than later uh and then moving yes. moving forward i know you will bill i know you will and moving forward to try to be a little bit more proactive until something more significant is done either by your residents and or by the town. Yeah.
Okay. And we have this same issue, just so you know, and it's very little of the road is ours. And because it's relatively flat, we don't have the issues that you do, but the people who live up on um, Sweet Road and up on the top of Loomis Hill who go to Stowe regularly want to go through the waterworks. And the waterworks is a class four road. It's the town of Stowe's road for the most part. And I think Stowe tries to grade that road once a year. Um, they don't do anything else there. The, the utility district, which used to be the village of Waterbury, has, uh, has two dams in Stowe on that road and a couple of different uh, uh, spring boxes on that road. So we've, we, the, the village has worked on some of those bridges. So it's, we get the same kind of questions from other people. Now, as I said, that road isn't ours and it's, it's Stowe's to, to deal with. And if it was as steep as yours, it would be the same issue that you have. Um, so anyway, I'll work with Bill and Celia tomorrow. And I, I know that Celia is getting ready to work up on Woodard Hill, and that's, that's got to be done. Um, but anyway, I'll see what I can do. And if anybody wants the highway standards as far as uh, re reclassification and what you need, if you leave Carla your email or you send Carla an email with your email address tomorrow, we can scan it in and just email it to you rather than make 40 copies. Or, uh, yeah. I, have a, I have a lot of empathy for all of you. Um, I hear your problem. I also, I guess I'm old school. Class four roads we used to think of as hunting camp roads. Uh, I know Ring Road has become far from that, but the problem is I think if we, if we make dangerous precedents in this town, there are other class four roads that could, you know, we, it won't go any, it, it could go all sorts of different places. There are a lot of private roads. I live on a private road. We have chose not to improve our road to the I think our road's better than most roads in town, but to meet the standard that we would need to bring it to town standards is crazy. It would cost us all, as homeowners, a lot of money. Mansion Hollow. Okay. Which I think... And that's true, I mean... You know, if you look at all these private roads that you know, are in the same kind of circumstances you are, we maintain our roads, and we all have to kick in money, and that's... Unfortunately, a little bit of a fact of life. You know, I'm, I'm not saying this, you know, it's a little bit of tough love the way I feel because I'm willing to pay to do my, my road. I think kind of, you know, the town's willing to do what they can, what, what Bill has said repetitively, what we really need to do as a class four road, you guys all need to, I think, look at it as what you want to see your road in and maybe put you know, have a fun put together and bring it up to what you feel you want to. I think that's a reasonable standard. And as taxpayers, because it's not just your road, it's all the other roads, it's all the private roads that, you know, where does it all end? You know, you know, our town could go bankrupt, you know, with uh, fixing, you know, providing services for every one of these roads. That's my thought. Can I ask a quick, what's the length of this road? Um, one mile, Ring Road, passed to the complete top just over one mile. That includes the private section. So a little, I would say a little over two thirds of a mile to about driveway. Six tenths of a mile to, our, to, the, to the cul de sac. Okay, thanks. A quarter mile of my driveway to the cul de sac. <laughs> George, how far is it up where you live? From uh, more than a mile. Yeah. yeah. Ring to us. Yeah, uh, my, my name is Dennis Rowland. I live at 633 Ring. I, I've learned tonight that the cul de sac is at the bottom of my driveway. I only lived there five years, so. Um, I just wanted to make the point that I keep hearing you say it's a class four road and it's up to the residents to do it, but the town, I, I guess, is allowing continued development up there. 
Who controls that? It is, well, a, it is the municipality. The, yeah. the, the, the town has the town has zoning regulations. Do you permit it? Yeah. It's so, their private property rights, sir. We, we, right. would, we would have a lot more problems if we told people you can't do anything with the property that you own. And by the way, well, it's a catch twenty two, though. Well, it's, it's not a catch twenty two. We have no control of who decides to buy property. You had control of where you decided to buy property and where you decided to live. And as as was just said a minute ago, and as I said a minute ago, the class four road, the, the town has chosen not to not to spend money on those class four roads. So there are people, Mansion Hollow, uh, Harvey Fire, mm -hmm. um, Pinnacle Ridge, Meadowcrest Lane, where people have come in since the you know 1970s probably and developed roads and they they built the roads you didn't have to build the road if you had to build a road to get to where you are then the road might look a little bit different than it does or maybe you wouldn't have decided to buy there at all because that's a long way to build a, a road and and it was so. in pretty good shape when I moved in, I had to say. There weren't any issues, but we were seeing continued development now, one right after another, and, and Schindler's going crazy up there. And we just had one continual highway of dump trucks and graders and loggers starting at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, is there no control over that? Well, fortunately, there is, there is a degree of control. You have uh, zoning regs that only permit certain size lots. That cuts down on the potential for housing development. Um, also, go, you to, have, go to the DRB and you have regulations. Pre present information when those permits come up that you're against them. You know, I know as a former DRB member that we usually would not hear too much. It was only maybe a neighbor or two that would object. And I don't disagree with what you what you just said. It, it, it's a problem, but we can't, as Bill said, prevent private owners from doing things. But you have to realize some of the implications of building, you know, on class four roads and other kind of circumstances. It's just that we're we're shooting ourselves in the foot by not yeah. putting some sort of control on what goes in there. There, there are controls. There are, there, are, there are lot size requirements. I think up in there it's at least 10 acres. There are, yep. there are high ridge, high elevation uh, uh, controls about what the properties can look like, what the building envelope is supposed to be. But, you know, people, we're in the 21st century now and People have more disposable income than they used to have. They have much better vehicles than they used to have. You know, when I sign, uh, if you're developing an individual lot, it's unlikely that you need an Act 250 permit. But there are many times where folks apply for a development and they need to get a municipal impact questionnaire done. And as the municipal manager, I said, yeah, we, we have a fire department, and they will go uh, if the bell rings. But frankly, the likelihood of the fire department getting to your house before it's, it's a cellar hole is pretty slim. We're not going to build another fire station at the bottom of the ring road. So, you know, and I, I don't live pretty close to the fire station. <laughs> <laughs> no water. Oh, that's the other issue. <laughs> okay, unless there's any more questions or comments, I think we can close it out here for the night. And Michael, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you all you. for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Appreciate it. And, uh, Thanks for the photos, Bob. <laughs> Tell the story. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, we moved in. We hosted a party for our neighbors, the residents. And Martha shows up. And when we moved in,